small group today, and um, we're talking about creating a writer's community within our classroom. And in a lot of these cases, they're going to be classes that aren't writing classes. I assume we're not writing classes, right? So we're, we're working on assigning papers and somehow getting people more vested in that process. And that's mostly what I'm going to cover today. Um, my name is Holly Block. Um, I'm an adjunct at American. I've been here since 99. Uh, and uh, before that, I taught at GW, and I was administrator at Hopkins before that. So I've um, been around doing this for a while, and I have some ideas that might be a little different from what you're doing in your classrooms, maybe. <laughs> the philosophy is basically that we're going to start off with. I don't know how to forward this thing. Let me see if I can do this. Hang on. Here we go. Boring stuff. Okay. The philosophy is threefold. One, what you want to do is create some kind of community um, and engagement in your classroom where students are vested in one another. And that might be in a large lecture hall, it might be in a small seminar, it might be with a TA group, but you want them interacting, you want them knowing each other, and then from there you can move on to focusing on writing, getting them vested in each other's writing, and eventually having them join the larger community of academics and really becoming vested in the subject matter. You can't get to this part at the end or it's very difficult to, without starting at this part. If you start by having them really vested in your class, I have virtually no absences in my classes. Mm -hmm. um, if you start by having them really vested in their class, get them really vested in each other, create a situation where they're interdependent, you can get them all to turn in their papers on time. You don't have that one outlier, because he doesn't want to mess things up, or she doesn't want to mess things up for the group. And I'm gonna talk about how you do that and still remain fair to everyone, okay? So I think it's kind of boring to talk about some of um, the ways you start, and it feels like a gigantic waste of time in the classroom. Um, oh, I skipped. Can I skip? Oh, I put them out of order. Here we go, one more. Excuse me? Yes. Um, the microphone's over there, like, can you just stand there? Stay near the microphone? Yeah, stand, yeah, okay, yeah. I won't go visit you guys anymore. Okay, so I think that everyone knows you start with a joke. Everyone knows you have an icebreaker. And everyone knows we only meet 28 times um, for less than 30 hours. So how do you cover everything you want to cover if that's all the time you have? And I'm going to say, no, make them get to know each other. But the end result of that is really profound, so you actually do want them to get to know each other. How do you do that? How do you do that save time? How do you do that save face? How do you do that cover your topic? How do you do that and not get that kid in the back row rolling his eyes? Well, one of the ways you start with is by not uh, accepting this floor plan. And I know that if you're in Word 1 or Word 2, that's just simply not possible. But if you have students who are sitting in rows, you have the one guy with his hand up engaged. You've got somebody who thinks he's cute, but she has to turn around to see him. You've got this guy who's on his phone. That guy who's playing, you know, Minecraft or something. You've got her, she's texting her roommate to make sure she got up for a final, right? And she doesn't know who he is or who he is. Just like you in the back row don't know you. You know, if I asked you to describe this young lady up here, you'd be like, mm, hair. Nice back. Nice back. <laughs> nice back. And um, so then, then enter the ubiquitous, I, I'm sorry, I'm walking away from the microphone. Enter the ubiquitous microphone, or the microphone, the ubiquitous icebreaker. And I know I've been to places where they say, oh, turn to your neighbor and introduce yourself. Turn to your neighbor and say, God be with you. Turn to your neighbor and say, you know, wish that, tell them about. And, it, and it's incredibly awkward, and I'm an extrovert. So I can't imagine, if you're a shy person or an introvert, what that must feel like. If I say, oh, you know, turn around and, and say hi to that person. So what you want to do, being conscious 
of different learning styles and different humans in your room, you want to do that in a slightly different way. Okay? So I have one way is to have a shared joke, right? To have it be something funny, something we can all enjoy and laugh about, and it can be at your expense. And I'm not saying go home and look up jokes for first day of class. I'm sure they exist. Icebreakers for first day of class, those also exist. Um, so I, you know, and sometimes I'll say, well, tell me about, you know, say your name and where you're from. You want to give the individuals context for the other individuals. You too, but for the other individuals. And I actually brought cardstock to have you guys do table pens, and then I was like, oh, lecture. There's not going to be a table in front of you to put a table pen on. But I do use table tents because your name's important and my name's important, and I need to know it. I'm really good at learning names. I'll learn them all the first day, but you won't learn each other's the first day. So we use those table tents for a couple weeks until people start to get the names down. Um, we're all wearing badges today. I probably covered mine with my scarf like a dork, but I have a, I have a table tent, so I'm lucky. So, so that way we start to get to know each other. I pass out colorful markers. Sometimes the color will help. Sometimes people put a doodle on them. If I go around and say, okay, introduce yourself, say where you're from, I go, oh yeah, she's the one from blank. That starts to stick in my head. You start to become a three-dimensional person. Tell me what you read or saw or binge watched over break. What did you binge watch over break? Star Wars. Star Wars, woo. You binge watch that or you went to the movie? I both. Both, yeah. <laughs> All right, so now we're like, okay, yeah, she's the chick from Tatooine. You got this, right? Um, so, uh, you know, and, and, and there have been times where I've had, I, when we've had a little more time, I've had them do uh, um, charades, which becomes funny. Then we get the shared joke. The kid can't act out. It's like, book? Uh, uh, you know. So and, and the, the personalities start to show, and then people start to become easier to get to know. If you turn your chairs, and I promised Nikki we would put them back when we're done, but if you turn your chairs so you can see each other, a little bit, and I promise not to leave the microphone too far. It's here, and it looks like it's five-dimensional, so I can walk around a little bit. I'm not going far. Um, now, suddenly, you have faces, right? And if you look up here at this chart, you can see the engagement level changes dramatically when people have faces. Does that make sense? I mean, that seems so simple. And I know you can't turn the chairs in Ward 2. I know there's plenty of rooms where you can't, you know, down in Krieger Auditorium, you can't turn the chair. It's not going to work. But you can put people in small groups. You can have other kinds of discussions because you've got to get them to know each other because they're going to have to become interdependent on one another for this whole writing thing to work out. And that's why I called it the setup. Oh, um, so some of the other things I listed up here, the ubiquitous icebreakers, um, like I said, one year um, to get people comfortable, it was right after the Nelson Mandela um, funeral, which was a very solemn event, which was made um, a caricature of itself by, if you remember, the sign language interpreter who wasn't. So while I had to read the boring syllabus, as required by the university on the first day of class, to them, um, I had different, I walked around and stood next to different students, they had to stand up and fake sign language interpret what I was doing. Now in fiction, uh, in screenplay writing, that's called the Pope in the pool. Uh, I won't explain why, but it's basically a distraction from, you have to get the exposition, you have to get the backstory, but it's kind of boring, so here's this ridiculous thing also going on on the side, which was the student fake sign language interpreting the code of ethics, academic integrity. All right, so using name tags and names, making sure students feel safe in the community. I make no bones about the fact that me, as a person, I'm left of left, but I will protect anybody in that classroom with their beliefs. And I will run to their aid if somebody starts to attack them and, um, and, and support them. And I'll say, you know, there's an argument to be made here. You might not be making it yet, but there's an argument on both sides, and we have to be respectful. That's super important um, as the university becomes more and more diverse politically, which is odd. Um, you get to have a little bit of fun sometimes, and I'll show you something that I'll use to get people's attention. It takes about 20 seconds. Um, and then if you're in a big group, um, like, like a lecture hall, you're going to want to have people work into smaller groups at points. 
And, and you want to swap out those groups so there's no frustration if someone feels that there's weak link or somebody who's not working well in a group. Swap them out three times over the semester if you put them into permanent group. But as they form smaller cohorts within your class, it matters. It matters. They bond. Okay. Um, oh, I was going to show you the funny thing. Hang on. Okay, so I'm not even going to bother setting this up because it does it all for itself in its own ridiculousness. Is it here? Nope, it's not there. I am not using that. There we go. Okay. Uh, what is that? And play. I don't know if the, you'll get the volume, but it doesn't really matter. Master of Pillows, if you feel the need to show somebody that you had this crazy workshop at 8.30 in the morning that showed you this crazy thing with a, like, a pony throwing pillows at people, staying there in my foot. Um, the, so so that, that took like 20 seconds, and it's, and it's the, everyone in here laughed because it's, it's absurd, right? It appeals to the absurd. You've got a cartoony pink pony throwing pillows. So if I've got a class that looks dead one morning, I'm doing that. I'm just pulling that up, and they're all like, what just happened? Right? Because it's, it's a reward, it's a wake-up call, and it's, a, and, it, and it's something you walk out of class an hour and a half later talking about, going, what was that video we saw at the beginning of class? And it becomes this thing that brings them together as a community. They all have that shared experience, right? So you find absurd viral videos. This is not an absurd viral video. But um, it, it, you, know, you find something absurd out there, and you show it in 15 seconds. wakes them up. It's entertaining, and it's easy to you looking up the dumb, funny thing happened on the way to the forum joke for the first day of class. Oh no, it's downloading more Puzzle Puff Pals. Yeah. <laughs> this is not canon, by the way, of My Little Pony. This is just some guy who makes these for fun um, and has created a character that is not a My Little Pony, not that anyone cares. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's it's an in thing in the like middle school, high school crowd these days. All right, so um, where was I? Was here? Yes, Ghosts of and I make it show from current slide, right? There we go. Nope. nope. Why is that up? Oh, okay, yeah. It worked, okay. Um, so, as you introduce, when we're moving out of building community, we're assuming we've built a community by putting people into groups and showing them something funny and, and having them introduce each other and, and face each other so they can see faces instead of backs of heads. Now we're moving into creating a, a, um, a, a community of writers. And as you do this, the main tool is something called the Writer's Workshop, and I probably don't need to tell you that a percentage of your students will have had a bad experience with that in the past. So that is something you're going to have to get over. Um, some of the issues that might come up, I did all the work, their comments were not helpful, it felt like a waste of time. Those are some attitudes they can come into the Writer's Workshop with. Now let me tell you, when you run it right, it, that's not what happens. And that's not going to be the reaction. They're going to be like, what was that other thing? So let me talk to you a little bit about how these writer's workshops are supposed to work. Okay? So the history of the writer's workshop was started, oh, there's some argument about whether it started in Hopkins or Iowa, late 30s, early 40s, maybe in the early 50s. But pedagogically, we know that the only way to improve someone's writing is through commenting on someone else's. It's the only thing that works. Not me with a red pen, not my husband, the math teacher, with this green pen, correcting things where they then go and do line edits. Um, it's not about putting a grade on something. It's about a conversation. So as a student puts comments on someone else's paper, those comments they put down, that advice they give someone else, is internalized. It changes their own internal editor so that the next time they put pen to paper, and that's a euphemism to put down at the keyboard, um, the next time they put pen to paper, their own internal editor has changed, 
they're a different person. They've improved their writing style so profoundly by saying, you know what you didn't do here? You didn't define your terms. You didn't give me the history of the thing you talked about. You didn't show me the context of this piece of it. And suddenly they're seeing their own work through that lens, that advice they gave. We give the advice we wish someone had given us, sometimes before we get it. So that's just how this magic box works. So put their minds at rest. If they give better comments than they get, it doesn't matter because the comments they get, really down here on the scale. The comments they give, up here on learning to be a better writer. And you all probably know that from grading papers, right? Before you started grading papers, you probably wrote differently. And then suddenly when you had to start grading papers, other things became more important to you as you wrote. When I work with um, fiction writers, the first thing I ask them is who their favorite authors are. Not because I'm testing them and I want them to say very important people, but because I want to know what's important to them about in, in reading. What do they like when they read? So I know what it's hel helpful to help them do when they write because that's where they want to go. So <coughs> the, the history and the pedagogy tells us that the only way to improve someone's writing is by giving comments on someone else's writing. So this is why the writer's workshop is engaged as early as kindergarten, why they've run into all different formats of it, and why this is the only historical format that's ever worked. So there's a couple ways to do it. You can take one that nobody has an attachment to, a paper from previous time, from one you wrote, a Duke one, one you bought off the internet, I don't care, and we can all workshop it together, and then no one gets personal, right? Um, the college writing program here at AU has a document called Atrium that has a bunch of papers you can use just for that purpose, which comes out once a year as student writing. Um, so, <coughs> so uh, 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 you have to explain to these students, you have to explain to them, yeah, we're doing this. You're going to exchange papers and you're going to get comments and the reason you're going to do this is because it'll improve your writing. And I know you might have had that experience. Acknowledge they may have had bad experiences in the past. You're gonna have that student who's never gotten anything but A's who's gonna be frustrated by it. And you have to explain to them, the reason you get nothing but A's is because you give good comments. And it helps you. Make sure they understand that. It's so important and no one's ever told them that before. I've talked to workshop leaders who've taught workshops for years who no one ever told them that. That's the case, that's the history behind this. This is why we do it. Um, so we model one with an anonymous piece. I have us. Uh, I have this PowerPoint and, uh, and all the documents I talk about are already up on the Blackboard site for this uh, tool workshop or what tool demonstration. So it, it, don't worry if I go fast. You can always go back and go through it. And my email's in there, and you can contact me. Um, value everyone's comments because don't don't say oh you know this is can we make this stronger by but you know I see you put some time in here. That's great, that's the first step. We need to put a little more time in here. Make sure you're always giving a value first before we move on and say, you know, that's not really how we want to do this. <laughs> okay, so here's some information about how to run the writing workshop. So you're going to have preset groups. I think three or four works nicely. Um, split up your class however you like. In the beginning of the semester, you won't know them as well. Later, you'll know who to put in which workshop. Um, Papers which should be distributed at least a couple days before the workshopping class. That gives students a chance to read the papers outside of class, write on them digitally or with ink. And then also, um, my paparazzi, they follow me everywhere. Um, and then also uh, uh, gives them a little time to digest it. When they come in to do the oral workshop in their small groups, you as the workshop leader float around and guide the conversation. So if something's getting a little iffy over here, you want to make sure to get over there and jump in and guide. The person whose paper's being workshop can pose questions. You know, I didn't really finish this paper, so don't bother giving me comments on the fact that there's no conclusion. What I'd like is comments on X. Great. Once they pose their question or given their comments, they don't get to talk anymore. That stops them from getting defensive. As soon as someone gets defensive in a workshop, it shuts down conversation, it shuts down communication. You don't want that. You want it to be as open and free-flowing as possible because, oh, well, I meant to do that. Oh, well, I just didn't get to that part. Um, well, yeah, I know I'm supposed to do that. And every time someone says that, the person who's giving the comment thinks, oh, they already know all this. I don't need to tell them anything. And they don't tell them the important stuff. So you want to make sure the person being workshopped is silent. That is, 
probably the most important piece of the puzzle. They must be silent while the piece is being worked on. Um, da -da 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 -da. Uh, you want to have another assignment ready because some people, there might be somebody absent, they don't have as much to do, they get through it faster, so that there's something else for them to work on and they don't sit there and start getting bored or something. So you want to make sure you have some backup thing for the people who finish. Um, once the people are done giving their comments, then the person can speak. Okay, I'm, we're all done. Now, now, if you wanted to, you know, have, give us feedback on anything we said, usually tempers have calmed by then. You want to make sure people start with the positive. What I really liked what you did in this paper, I see you did these steps. I liked how you blank, and then move to the constructive. I wish there'd been more on this. I wondered about that. Um, I had some line edits. You might want to proofread a little more carefully, but that's a little more, that's, that's last step, right? You want to make sure the content is there first. I think I hit all of these. <coughs> yes. All right. I tried to put a, a slide thing on my watch, but it didn't work. All right. So um, lastly, I think it's the last one on the writing workshop. So you're going to use workshop. Oh, no, it's not. You're going to give credit for peer review. Now, how do you do that? How do you give credit for peer review? There's so many ways to do that. First of all, microphone. First of all, you can um, you can do it within Blackboard if you save the sign, so they can post drafts and there's a place to post your comments. Awesome, it's all right there. You can see it. They can all access it the way you set it up, um, or you can do it on paper. If you do it on paper and you're having them turn in paper papers or paper papers, <laughs> you can um, you can just have them turn in the drafts with the final. And what I typically do is I give a couple of points for good peer review. If it's good, maybe one. If it's not, and um, but they don't get the point unless the person who wrote the paper turns in the peer review. And they should turn it in on time. So now they're going to turn in their paper on time so that they don't screw Emily out of her extra credit points. Right? It's not just about me and, oh, I don't feel like finishing this paper. It's, oh, crap, if I don't do this, they're going to be mad at me. Or I don't want, she's a really nice person. She gave me such great comments. She's been helping me. I want to make sure <laughs> I get this in on time so they get the credit. So this is another way you're building that interdependence. First, we make them all like each other and have a common laugh. And now we're going to make them interdependent. They have to help each other get to the next step. In the world, you don't live in a vacuum. I mean, as a writer, I live more in a vacuum than most. But even we, don't, we have editors and publishers and people who change everything down the road. So um, I worked on a book for two years with an author uh, that's coming out. People came out to me what it's called. And I said, I don't know. They changed the title. <laughs> it used to be called Depth of Field. Sold for seven figures. That's all I remember. Um, all right, so uh, uh, you want to give credit for those peer reviews and have them be interdependent. Uh, uh, you can put pressure on them by only giving credit on the peer reviews that are turned in on time. Uh, you can also, this is something I do with the first paper with freshmen, first semester, is uh, if the entire class turns in their paper at the beginning of the class where it's due, everybody brings it in right then, that first moment, electronically, how we're turning it in that day. Microphone. Uh, I'm tethered. Then, then you all, um, then, then we'll do something. <coughs> we'll go outside for class. I'll order pizza. I'll bring in some candy. I'll bake some muffins. I'll pick up bagels. I, I, it, sometimes it's food. Sometimes it's, I'll, t I'll show you another Flufflepuff video. It, it, it doesn't matter. It's just they all know that if one of them doesn't turn in that paper on time, they screwed it up for the group. And they all turn in their papers on time. It doesn't matter how small that uh, gift is, that, that reward. They'll, it's a bribe. I'm honest. But they'll all do it. Like, no, we want that thing. And I'm not talking about canceling class or getting out five minutes early or anything. Sometimes, once, once um, they were all really into dogs, and I had an adorable dog. He's like 25 pounds and furry and looks like a living stuffed animal. He's really sweet. And I'll say, okay, I'll bring him to campus on a Wednesday, and I'll sit on the quad, and you guys can come pet him. We all want to pet the dog. We'll even get out of bed and do it at 10 o'clock in the morning. So it doesn't have to be food or you're spending money. Um, it can be a lot of different things. But, but it definitely makes them care about each other, it makes them know each other, and it gets us to this next step, which is the thing that you wanted to get to in the beginning. Oh, this is, oh, this is a sample of a peer review worksheet. So 
if you don't trust them to put the right kind of comments on there, you don't want to spend the time training them. I sometimes do worksheets. And this is an example of like the meat of one. Is the topic a good one? Does it work? Et cetera, et cetera. Thesis. Um, can you find the introduction? Is paper easy to understand? And it, for your field, you may have more technical questions on here or things that you need involved in the paper. Um, you know, and, and, and if you were grading the paper, what grade would you give? So it gives them an opportunity. There's a lot of space. It's a, it's a Word document. I just glued it in here. Um, and then there's an opportunity to put more comments on the back. And I know it's kind of small, but I wanted to give you an idea what kinds of things would be on there. Like I said, the actual documents on the Blackboard site, you can see them. Okay, so the last step then is how do we then take the community we built, became a writer's community, they're supporting each other in writing, how do we then make them into a community of academics? And you do that by taking this yet another step forward in the developmental process, in the, in the research process, in the academic process. You're going to get them to all be experts in things. You're going to allow them to talk about their topic. Um, you'll see how in a sec. All right. So here, I, basically, I put up a couple samples of, of, of things. I actually, thought you can tell when I always tell my students, if I use the word thing, it means I didn't get enough sleep last night. <laughs> <laughs> the exercise, these, this is one exercise. I call it Socratic testing. Some people call it Socratic questioning. What we do is we're, we're, and I didn't invent it, I borrowed it from multiple people um, from my department and elsewhere, but you, you, you put them um, in pairs, they're at a point where they might have a thesis or they at least know a topic. And they put that at the top of the page and then you have a list of questions up on a board, for lack of a better term, a flip chart, a whiteboard, whatever. Um, and you're going to, <coughs> excuse me, you're going, you're going to put these questions up, and I scroll up and put more and more up as we go along. Uh, but they're, they're open-ended, quote-unquote, Socratic questions, and they pass this paper back and forth. So I put my topic down. Did I put a sample? Maybe it's on the next page. I don't remember. No, it's on the next page. All right, so um, the roll of the green light at the end of the dock in Great Gatsby. They all groan when you say that, so I like to bring that up. All right, so um, it is about money and greed and envy. And so then the, the, they, ha they exchange papers, and the person writes, what are you implying? And they have to answer that question, and they switch their papers back. Uh, what is this an example of, you ask? What, how are you going to prove this? Have you checked this source? Have you looked here? Are you going to include this? And you, and you get them to think more about their topic when they haven't even written the paper yet. Right, so you're expanding their mind by having their peers ask them these preset questions. They have this digitized conversation. You can have them do it electronically. I usually just have them switch papers back and forth because that way I can see it happening. Um, they, it's probably one of the assignments they love best of all. Uh, so they get so much out of that because it really makes them think about their topic in a way they might not have. And again, that, that one's on Blackboard too. Number think slide is this? Twelve. Okay. Thank you. Okay, can you see that one? All right. Um, so scavenger hunts. I use a bunch of these off and on. Uh, one of them I'll use like maybe one of the first days when we're talking about proofreading. I'll put them in teams and they have to find typos in the syllabus. Um, another one I'll they'll have their their everyday writer and I'll say, okay, here's a list of MLA questions. Go find the answers in this. So they get their book, they know that bring their books ahead of time and they all scramble through the books and it's timed and they're, it's basically extra credit points. I mean, it's very low pointage, but they have fun with it. Or APA, if you use APA. Um, and then my library scavenger hunt, and again, I think I have samples of these, I'm going to click through in a sec. Uh, library scavenger hunt has them running around the library finding things. So it makes them, it breaks the membrane of having to open a boring book to look for something instead of just Googling the answer to everything. Here's a textbook where everything is together. You don't have to go find it. Um, here's the library with amazing things. You know, how do you use this database? How do you go here? How do you order something from interlibrary loan? And they have, give me a picture of a book on a shelf. So um, they have fun with that. And, it, and it, it, you don't have to spend a lot of time on it. You don't have to do it during class. 
here's it. You can't really read it. But it does have a light scavenger hunt. And like I said, I put that up on Blackboard if you want to see it. I went a little crazy last night. Um, there's a library scavenger hunt. Which you can't read. A photo or a screenshot from a book called Treatise on Man by Descartes. Uh, a screenshot from an interlibrary loan request. The first page of an article in which George W. Bush is speaking about the axis of evil or where Richard Nixon or Ronald Reagan um, discuss the red threat. It, so it's, it was for a course on terror. So give you an idea of those kinds of things. Um, here's another one. <laughs> I'm not sure I put this one on the Blackboard site. But thesis commentary. So we got them at a point where they have a thesis. So we take a piece of paper, and I already have it laid out in a grid. It says name, and it says thesis on it. They write their thesis at the top of the page. Oh, this is the one where I wrote a thesis. It says uh, name Hermione Granger thesis. While viruses can mutate, it's still a rational act to look for vaccines and cures for them in their current states. Okay, and then. They all have them at their seats. Everyone stands up. I like to get blood flowing occasionally, make people walk around. And they walk around the room randomly, and in the block with their name, they write in their comment about the thesis or the question. And they hit all of them. In about 25 minutes, it's amazing what they can do. Um, if you don't have that much time, you don't use that much time. If you have more time, you use more time. Usually, uh, we try to do that like on a day where our, maybe it's the day before spring break or the day before Thanksgiving or something. Um, or not the day before Thanksgiving, I'd be too late for a paper. But anyway, so, so they get all these great comments. And better than that, what my students have told me is it's so cool to see how everyone else is structuring their thesis and the kinds of things and details they're including. They all come back with a different thesis the next class. So here they are all interactively learning from one another. It's not me standing in the front of the room like I am torturing you today, <laughs> lathering at them, but they're actually seeing, oh, that's what that could look like. That's how that could be interpreted. That's how that could work. All right, so that's another one. Um, but there's tons of these out there, and like I said, I put a bunch of them on the Blackboard site. Uh, presenting final papers. And I know they can take forever, but your students have just spent undue weeks researching some topic of somewhat of interest to them and to you. Um, now their colleagues are somewhat vested in the writing of them. They've helped them out on peer reviews, They've helped them with their thesis. They've helped them look deeper at their topics, do Socratic texting. Whatever they've done, they're vested in, in some of the other papers in the class. They kind of want to know how it turns out. Um, some of my colleagues will use the final exam time. You know, they'll give a take-home final, and they'll use the final exam classroom time that we're required to use um, to do some poster sessions or three five-minute presentations on the final paper. So there's that final opportunity, it's almost like a party because it's this final opportunity to share what you've learned and you want them to be proud. They most likely are proud, you know? Give them an opportunity to, to say, look at what I found out about this bizarre thing. Look at what, look at what I found out about what, um, what the, the, uh, um, the cost of, me of mental health on our workforce, lost work days. Look at what it affects the genes. I would have never known that. Look at what I found out about, about, I had papers on ISIS before I ever heard of it, three or four months before it was in the news. I had a paper on the Boko Haram before the kidnapping that everybody heard about. You know, I mean, these kids dig in, they find out things. Young people, students, academics. So, so let them be proud of what they found out and discovered and let them share it. Give them some kind of opportunity. Even if they're just share it, posting it on Safe Assign or Blackboard or something so that if students want to, they can go and look at an outline or, or a poster session or something. I, I think it's worthwhile. Gives them that opportunity to say, yeah, that was good. Even before you, as the instructor, slap a grade on it and give it some value. It already has value, right? Um, <coughs> so, uh, 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 damn, there's a few more slides. Was that the next one? Yeah. All right, so uh, reiterate, we're creating community creating a community of writers, and then create, moving into creating a community of academics. Yes, it takes a little more work on your part. Yes, it eats a little time at the beginning of class. But the value of it, of having your students not miss class and show up at your, work, at your office hours or via email and say, what I missed, invaluable, right? <laughs> Did I miss anything? <laughs> so um, so, so that, that's re 
really valuable, even though it sucks a lot of time. The community of writers improves their writing dramatically without you having to do very much about it, right? They're interacting with each other. They're helping each other. They're, they're inter becoming interdependent. And then here, that's the end goal, right? You want this community of academics who care so much about the topic, about your topic, about your class, that they want to share this information that they have. And I want to thank you for your time. Like I said, everything is on. If you go to the Ampharon Blackboard site, that um, they've sent you the links to a few times, and go to this workshop, which is T4, I think, tools for It'll have this PowerPoint and uh, just about every document I mentioned. If I forgot one, let me know and I'll post it, but I think I have all of them up there.